Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hicks, welcome. Um, I was actually quite encouraged by the previous administration's efforts to increase DOD investments in critical R&D priorities like directed energy, hypersonics, I believe you mentioned, artificial intelligence. I would note, however, that these technologies are really of little use unless they're transitioned out of our labs and into the hands of actual service members around the world. Um, if confirmed, how would you use your role overseeing the department's internal management processes to speed and improve that tech transition process? Thank you, Senator. First, I agree with you that there has been uh, uh, some positive momentum in, in key areas of R&D, and, and I do think a sustained level of R&D investment is vital. But also, to your point, we actually have to field capabilities, and that's a place where DOD has really struggled. Some of the tools that the deputy could have, working especially with the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is to develop some incentive approaches to get um, experiments, field experiments underway, even beyond experiments up to exercise, major exercise level use of capabilities and prototypes that can start to demonstrate the value of some of these new approaches. And when we can demonstrate value, then we're in a much better position to have a dialogue with Congress and with industry about where that, um, where those capabilities can take us and that can help us overcome that valley of death. I also think, there, frankly, we should be looking at how we think about new starts so that we can manage the appropriation cycle more effectively. Um, if I were confirmed, I'd wanna get in and understand what makes sense both from a congressional oversight perspective and from the department's perspective, uh, especially in so areas like software where the cycle time is so much faster than the typical appropriation cycle. Thank you. I, I would really encourage your, uh, your focus on this issue, and in particular with, you know, directed energy, I've watched as the, uh, the experiments have been, you know, proving themselves over and over again, but the desire within the Pentagon to sort of chase the perfect application when there are so many applications where it can provide real value to a warfighter now um, is a real tension and I think is, is in many cases doing uh, as a disservice. You helped lead the Biden team team's transition of the Department of Defense over the last several months. Uh, you know, I've read with great concern a number of public reports that the previous administration worked to block key transition officials from accessing critical information related to worldwide operations. What's your assessment of how those obstructions impacted important DOD programs and operations? And what can we do on this committee to give you and Secretary Austin the resources you need as you stand up this new team? Senator, I, I did have the privilege of leading the uh, defense agency review team. And let me first say that the, the vast majority of folks that we worked with in the Pentagon were incredibly helpful, um, knowledgeable, forthcoming, and it's um, impressive every day, frankly, to, to have gone in and seen those military and civilian professionals doing their job. So the challenges we faced were really around a handful of, of uh, folks um, that made, made things difficult. I think the biggest challenge that I will face if confirmed because of this is around budget transparency. Um, the Trump administration worked on an FY22 budget uh, typic that's not unusual, but typically that information is shared with the transition team because uh, the administration will owe to Congress a, a, a president's budget submission in the spring. So um, the inability to look at that information, um, the team, I think, after I was confirmed, so I was not a part of it, did have some ability to look at the information um, late in January. But I think it will cause some delay in the timeline by which we can um, give budget quality information back to Congress. So that would be the area I would, I would ask for a, a, a little relief on understanding. You know, uh, Dr. Hicks, two weeks ago, I asked Secretary Austin during his confirmation hearing about his plan to prioritize PFAS cleanup and remediation. And I, I have to be honest, I was, I was discouraged when Secretary Austin sort of deflected DOD's responsibility for PFAS contamination 
in communities around the country, including one of the hardest hit communities around Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico, despite overwhelming evidence that DOD activities there were the sole source of the contamination. And that is the case in many of these instances. Um, if confirmed, how will you work to prioritize DOD's efforts to, to stand up and address PFAS cleanup and, and work with these communities? Well, Senator, first, I think it's important that senior leadership in the Pentagon meet with the families themselves and the community members and understand um, what exactly has, has occurred and what the consequences have been. I also think it's imperative, as Secretary Austin has done, to make it clear that it's a priority for the department, um, both to ensure it's not putting contaminants out into its uh, military families, military service members, and of course the communities that surround them. And that when we see instances we're working with EPA, I know there's now CERCLA authority um, that we can access uh, with regard to PFAS, that we are working on solutions to um, uh, do cleanup, and frankly, to meet the timeline. Congress has given us a clear timeline um, for removing PFAS out of our uh, firefighting approaches, and uh, if, if confirmed, I'm committed to meeting that timeline. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. 